I'm so happy to be part of this uh, meeting. Yeah, let us. Uh, I hope we can get some uh, some protocol information because we Qatar is being prepared to face the party mutual evaluation this year, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's been yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah. That's all. Okay. Yeah. It's your turn, guys. <laughs> Sahil, please. Is it my turn? Yeah, go ahead. It's yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Assalamu alaikum to all of y'all. Um, I should really thank Malavan and Serendip Training because uh, I'm actually a break from work. So your trainings have really kept me in touch with uh, AML and compliance and risk management and like operations management. Operations management is one is mind blowing. Your sessions are mind blowing, I should say. <laughs> so, I mean, I should <clears throat> say that everybody should take advantage of this, these sessions and you know, listening to these sessions, there are a lot of insights on what your peers have to say about compliance, risk management, because all of them have different experiences. All of them mm -hmm. are different institutions. Each institution's risk appetite is different. So it's really a very good platform to learn about your uh, about the basically the compliance landscape in the respective countries. So That's you know, I, I would say hats off to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. Much, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rami, go ahead. Rami, you were about to say something. Rami? Oh, uh, anyone, uh, anyone's Alanod. <coughs> oh, Maher Dalal. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Maher. Please. Yeah, this is uh, Maher Dalal, um, an internal audit manager uh, from Masul Farayan. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, from Qatar, actually, based in Qatar. Um, actually, we, I am very interested to join uh, the session to uh, know more about uh, the fact of mutual evaluation and uh, uh, how can we prepare. And I don't know, you can, you can always, uh, you always need to, um, to know more about the preparation because it's never enough. So I'm so excited to, to attend and learn more uh, through this uh, session today. Thank you for inviting Thank us. You. Thank you, Maher. Thank you uh, for attending. Thank you. Was it Amal? Or Alunud, please feel free. Are we having a very shy crowd, Anne? No, people are forgetting to unmute, I think. <laughs> I know it's. Uh, We're going to chant the for those who don't speak. <laughs> exactly. So now I know whom to charge. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Excellent. Okay, we got a few minutes more. Anyone else would like to introduce themselves? Omar, Stephanie. I think Stephanie is from Germany. Stephanie Schmidt. I'm a bit the odd one out geographically, but I, <laughs> I thought I'd jump uh, uh, at the opportunity because uh, Germany was actually scheduled for an update in the FLTF uh, evaluation. And uh, even if I have been an MLRO for, for an extremely long time, I was never involved in, in the processes and uh, how it works. And uh, due to COVID-19, we, we have now a little bit more time until 2021, I think. But um, this is uh, the reason why I joined this. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Most welcome, Stephanie. Most yeah. welcome. If, I, if I'm correct, Germany has not undergone the, uh, the evaluation under the new methodology. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The last one was in 2010. Yeah. yeah. So and, uh, in the same, same as Qatar, there they haven't gone through um, a, a mutual evaluation through the new methodology. So that's mm -hmm. uh, that. It brings quite a number of changes, and it's um, we go through that today. Okay. Is there anyone from Pakistan? Because uh, I was told that they have the evaluation in October this year. Yeah, hi. Um, this is uh, Nasir Islam. Oh, uh, hi, Nasir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, 
I'm a chief internal auditor at Faisal Bank uh, at Karachi. Okay. So very much interested to know how the FATF mutual evaluation works. Uh, it, it will be greatly affecting Pakistan. How prepared are you guys? Yeah, yeah. We, we're trying our best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the latest one is October 2019 for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Madavan, I don't know if you, should we, should we give it a go? Sure. I can started? give the basic ground rules and then I'll hand it over to you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I think four months into the pandemic, um, okay. most of us should be very, very familiar. We should be very familiar with uh, how to use Zoom. So um, I think I don't have to go through, you know, what each and every tool that you need to use. But this is, uh, bear in mind that this is a discussion, not a seminar, not a webinar. So you can interrupt as much as you want, okay? As long as it's specific to the subject, have a very healthy discussion. Uh, since we have only uh, 90 minutes, it flies qu rather quickly. So keep your questions very brief. Uh, share your experiences. Let's, I mean, uh, since, it's, see, because it's a discussion, we would like to learn your experience as well, especially Nazir. We are very keen to know <laughs> because Qatar is next. Okay. So enjoy your session at the, uh, yeah. we are going to, we are recording this session as well. So these recordings will be shared with everyone. Please play it with your team. And we would also like to issue certificates if that's not a problem for anybody. Okay. So once the session is over, please email me the need that has to appear on the certificate and I will send you the soft copy. Thank you very much. Enjoy the session. Please uh, keep your videos open and uh, you can keep your mics muted, but the videos let it be open. Thank you very much. And all yours. Thank you very much, Madhavan. I think, I think actually I need, I need as well this certification for my accounts. Uh, on, on ongoing uh, uh, I'll think about it, Anne. I'll think no, about it. No. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so I think this is the third four sessions we're doing with Manavan with Serendi training. Uh, yes. So, um, um, yes. Uh, had some sessions on operational risks, various different, uh, you know, the, what the role of the second line is and uh, we will have more sessions. Uh, they, they, they're not meant to be training, formal training, but I think people have found them very useful because of their interactive nature uh, and because we can share experiences and share you know, tips and, and, and best practices that we, we see and, and, and really it's a forum where people feel safe to um, raise uh, any questions and raise concerns or where they have difficulties and to get some some feedback from the other the other attendees. So that's um, I think that these sessions are actually very very rich and very useful for everybody. So today we're going to uh, focus on <laughs> FAO and the mutual evaluation pr process. But more than the process, the practical process is what Hello. actually how actually can you as a um, uh, sorry to interrupt and uh, can I request everyone to mute your mic? Or what I can do is I can mute from my end. And whenever you want to speak, please feel free to unmute your mic and ask your question. Oh. I'll check it that you don't unmute me. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we're back, we, we, we back, we back to business. So, yes. um, yeah, so really the, the point today is uh, to ensure that one, we understand the process at a high level, I'm not going to, to go into nitty gritty details, but, uh, and, and definitely what the FATF is uh, assessing when they do this mutual evaluation. So really very much, you will know, or you should know at the end of the session, which areas the FATF will be looking at and uh, what they expecting to see, and what they expecting to find. Uh, and I would also highlight the changes into the evaluation methodology between before 2012 and after 2012, because there's, there's been a major change. So let's get started. As we, um, as Malavan just mentioned, uh, we, uh, Malavan, are you sharing the screen or can you share your screen or should I share mine? 
uh, it'll be better if you can, sh or, oh, sorry, okay, let me share, bear with me. Uh, you can keep uh, talking, I'll uh, share the Thank screen. You. So yes, as Manavan said, it's an interactive session. We've already, we, we always do it this way. There will be some general principles. So really going, going in, in depth into some of the recommendations and some of the uh, uh, assessment criteria. Uh, also, we've taken Qatar as, um, uh, as an illustration. So just to, just to show and, 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 and show what has been done so far and, and what is expected uh, to happen. So what you should be aware of uh, especially in the, case, in the case where you haven't been through a pro, uh, an evaluation since 2012, 2013 actually, for, on the 2012 methodology. So um, getting back to the next slide, Malavan. Hello, Malavan. Sorry. Uh... Is this the one or the next one? Uh, I can't see your screen. Can everybody see the uh, the presentation? Yes. Yes. Why can't I see it? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I can see it now. You okay. can. Perfect. Yes, that's the one. Right. So with um, the methodology change in 2013, what has changed um, is very much on the first aspect of the assessment. So the methodology since 2013 comprises of two set of criteria. One set is on effectiveness uh, and it's actually according to 11 immediate outcomes. The other one is on technical compliance. And here you would always all be familiar with the 40 recommendations. So what we do, what the FATF does, is that they look at all the 40 recommendations and they assess technical compliance against each. What does it mean? So what they do is that they will assign a rating against each of the 11 immediate outcomes for effectiveness and a rating against each of the 40 recommendations on technical compliance. The ratings, both ratings are on a four, four level scale. So from high effectiveness to low effectiveness, for instance, for, for immediate outcomes uh, and, and, a, and a four level uh, type of, uh, of assessment as well on, on technical compliance, uh, you know, from low to compliant, largely compliant, partially compliant, non-compliant. And then you could have not applicable uh, in, very, in very few instances. So here we go, four scale for each and um, that actually means that overall, they don't calculate as such an overall rating, but the outcome of that is going to be, uh, and, and they publish, they, they know, you can find them that these ratings for every country and every assessment, whether it's a follow-up assessment or initial assessment, you can find that on their website. At the end of the presentation, I've got all the, all the links with all the sources. One of them is goes directly to the, uh, and you can even download the, the, the big spreadsheet um, and you can see, you know, which country is rated, uh, rating again, each of the 11 outcomes or technical compliance rating. So it's, it's all very, uh, very transparent. Then obviously uh, there is a, um, you know, a report which is being written uh, and then it goes into the plenary session uh, at the FATF. Uh, not for, from, it's submitted from the regional uh, FATF to, to the main FATF uh, and, and, and the, core, uh, the core members, the core 40 members. Um, the rating uh, assess basically the, the, the very difference are around the 11 immediate outcomes. So the 11 immediate outcomes, we're gonna go through them. And it, think a little bit about 11 immediate outcomes and technical compliance in a, in, a, in a bit of a different way. And I, I'll try to explain you, to you how, how you can, how you can actually make a, a, a similarity with, with, uh, with what you would be very familiar with in your own compliance framework. So think about technical compliance as a framework design um, or control design. And think about the 11 immediate outcomes on effectiveness as being the control effectiveness assessment. So does the control operate or not? Um, 
I think that's very easy then to understand, you know, technical compliance is, do you have the right policies, do you have the right laws, do you have the right uh, powers in the regulators, in the authorities, um, <clears throat> You know, have you have you defined properly what uh, a financial crime is, what a predicate crime is, um, how is it uh, criminalized? So it's all about the laws and the regulation. So it's all what's in the books. Um, and then the eleven immediate outcomes and the effectiveness assessment comes with how well these are effectively applied, implemented, and effective. So it, it really looks at the outcome. Yeah, one is the design, the other one is the effectiveness and the outcome. So going to the next slide, uh, you will have uh, so a, 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 the two definitions uh, for each. So you have, you know, as, as it says here, it relates to the relevant legal for technical compliance, relevant legal and institutional frameworks of the country and the powers and procedures of the competent authorities. Uh, these represent the fundamental bending blocks of an AML CFT system. Obviously, if you don't have the right framework, if you don't have the right policies, you know, you have policies in compliance, I'm pretty sure you do, um, then, you know, it would be by real chance that people do the right thing. <laughs> if you don't have the policies and procedures, people won't be able to actually apply those. Um, and then the effectiveness assessment differs because it's the assessment of the technical compliance. So it's how the control designed or the framework design is actually operating effectively. Um, and it identifies to what extent the outcomes are, are effectively achieved. So I think that this is also, this is a recognition by FATF um, that a lot of the, you know, there's been a lot of ticking the boxes before with just the recommendation, the 40 recommendation. We're moving now really to understand whether what we've designed is working and what we've designed is effectively applied. Uh, so I, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm not going to name the country, but um, you could have an enforcement unit or in law, you know, you have an even you, you have a, by decree an enforcement agency which is being created in a country. But actually, you know, it could be that no one actually is has has been appointed. So practically your enforcement unit is empty. There's nobody to actually do the enforcement activities or that the number of enforcement investigations um, and, and activities of that enforcement unit, which is set up, is actually pretty much nil. So it doesn't feel like there is any kind of enforcement activities being undertaken in the country, and therefore criminals are still running and, and enjoying their assets, the proceeds of their crimes. So that's a, that's a, very, that's a very good example, and I think very relevant to, to the region we are here. Uh, very relevant to um, especially you know the G countries in the GCC, but also Pakistan, um, and and it's 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 actually a point uh, of failure in uh, in many 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 jurisdictions. So today, because it's so very new, uh, I'm sure a number of you <clears throat> are already very very familiar with the 40 recommendations. Obviously, we've had some time at the end, so if you have any questions on some of the recommendations please do ask. It doesn't mean that by looking at the 11 immediate outcomes, we're going to forget about the recommendation, 40 recommendations, because these are about the effectiveness of these recommendations. So there's only 11 of them. And you will see actually that in the effectiveness assessment, some of the immediate outcomes are really to do with, uh, they're really under the responsibility of the country's legislation, legislator, authorities, um, you know, laws, regulators, etc. Some of them are both at a country level, but also at an FI level for DNFBPs to uh, implement. So we're going to really focus on those in particular. I'm going to go through the next slide uh, where you should be able to see the list of all the 11 immediate outcomes. Voila, here they are. So those which, which have an asterisk against are those where you can clearly play a role in. I mean, if you're looking at outcome one, outcome one is about uh, money laundering and terrorist financing risk are understood 
and where appropriate actions coordinated domestically to combat money laundering and financing of terrorism and proliferation of weapon of mass destruction as implicit. Um, here, okay, you're going to say, yeah, it's, uh, it's all to do with the country, but actually the, 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 there is a word here which is understood. So I think here, the awareness and training and um, making sure that part of your framework, compliant framework, includes appropriate training and communication and awareness at all levels is very important because if it's understood at country level, you know, at the high level, uh, by the regulator and, and, and the agencies, but it's not the case in FIs, um, then we have a problem. So I think here the word understood is very important and it really takes, takes you to a training and awareness program that you should have in place, um, um, not only in design, but also practically effectively implemented and, and refreshed on a regular basis. Immediate outcome two is probably more about, uh, it's probably more about, uh, about activities at, at the jurisdiction level, because it's really about cooperation between the various, for instance, various FIUs, financial intelligence units, to share information and cooperation between the various authorities to make sure that because you know financial crime is of very international nature then that uh, criminals do not um, escape one jurisdictions and can hide into another one so it's really about making sure that it's proper uh, coordination and, and cooperation um, and, and also evidence uh, to share the evidence to share documentation to facilitate um, you know, the, the, the arrest and, and, uh, proceed and, and, and freeze of proceed of crime, confiscation of proceeds of crime. Outcome number three uh, is also to do with supervisors. Uh, you know, they, it's all to do with an effective supervision regime uh, and how they can demonstrate that, um, you know, in line and commensurate to the risk. So that is very important. And I, th I think the, the risk-based approach is also important across the board. You know, it, it, does, it, it does matter for risk management, generally speaking, but ever so much in, in compliance because you cannot review every single transaction as a compliance officer or MLRO. And similarly, if you are at a supervision level, you are not going to supervise every firm the same way. So you're going to need to have a risk assessment made. And then on that basis, you're going to monitor the firms uh, more or less, uh, with more or less scrutiny uh, and more or less frequently. Uh, similarly to what a FI would do for customers, exactly the same. So I think here there are lessons as well that we can take uh, at, at, level, at, at our level when we, when we implement and design and implement a, a compliance framework. The outcome number four uh, is really some one that, where we can really make a difference and we can really make a difference in getting the rating effective for the country overall. Uh, and here, I don't know if you, you are, I assume you are familiar with DNFBPs and VASAPs, vast power virtual asset service providers, um, some insertions re relevant to virtual assets and virtual asset service providers, cryptocurrencies, currency exchange platforms, etc., were introduced um, uh, last year. Uh, and I was actually part of the, the working group to review all the 40 recommendations to include the, um, the VASAPs uh, and VAs into the 40 recommendations for the FATF. And, um, and so that now is fully included in some of the recommendations uh, where, where that was relevant. Uh, and also you can see here in terms in, into immediate outcome number four. So the emergence of FIs, fintechs, uh, crypto monies, uh, digital money, uh, digital assets, uh, stable coins and all, all these actually is now um, has been included into FATF recommendations uh, and immediate outcome assessments from last year. So I invite you to, to look at those um, if, if it's relevant for your firm, obviously. Uh, and, and here really it's, it's applying AML CTF preventative measures commensurate to the risk and report suspicious transactions. We're gonna go through that in detail. Immediate outcome number five, is about um, the, the mis preventing the misuse of, um, of money laundering and uh, tourist financing and information on the beneficial ownership. Very important word to rem remember here, beneficial ownership. It's available to competent authorities. We have it. We've done the verifications that are required 
uh, and it's record keeping around that. So it's about transparency. The actually, you know, the uh, there are a number of um, regulatory regimes. One at the EU level. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, you would be familiar. Some of you would be familiar with those, with the fifth uh, money laundering rec uh, European directive, uh, money laundering directive now um, requiring from the first the 10th of January 2020 this year to have uh, beneficial ownerships registers in all of the 27 EU countries. Um, I don't know what the UK decided to do, but uh, they, they, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure they have uh, also implemented this. So you can see that there is increased focus on, um, on, on beneficial ownership uh, and, and that's across the world, but I think the EU money laundering directives number five has actually raised even further the bar there and is leading a bit the, the pack. Um, immediate outcomes six and seven, um, again, and eight, very much also to do with, uh, uh, with the competent authorities. It's about financial intelligence units uh, and it's about uh, you know, investigation of offenses and uh, prosecution uh, and dissuasive sanctions applied, uh, if any. And then obviously, at number eight, focuses on confiscation. We'll see that it's, it's, it's partially relevant to us because obviously we need to make sure that we comply with uh, competent authorities uh, when they do require us to confiscate or, or free some assets. Number nine, 10, 11, are really where we can also make a substantial difference uh, and help with the rating. You have the investigation uh, of terrorist financing offenses, offenses and uh, the prosecution. So here, again, uh, similar a bit to outcome eight, uh, we should be able to do the investigation as well ourselves uh, without tipping off, obviously. Um, and we, we have the, we have the uh, the duty to actually do the investigation if we have something suspicious and report those to the authorities so very relevant to, to, to us. Terrorist uh, organizations, uh, raising moving funds. So here really, um, and the non-for-profit organizations. I don't know if you deal a lot with not-for-profit organizations. There is a whole set of recommendations as part of the FAT40 recommendations related to NPO sector. Uh, but it's really, uh, uh, it's considered, it's not considered, it's not flagged as necessarily systematically high risk as a client for FIs, but uh, they should be under real scrutiny because, uh, you know, a number of those have been associated with helping with transferring funds uh, to help terrorist activities. So we really want to, to prevent that from happening. Uh, and we should really be dealing with those which have, are registered, are have, have, a, have a, a clear purpose. Um, and I don't know if you know, but in the UAE, non-for-profit organizations are under uh, very severe uh, regulation uh, and they need, to be, they need to be authorized, properly authorized. So you don't, it's, you know, instead of Europe, if you, if, if, you, if you look at a number of countries in Europe, you have a number of uh, very, very large numbers of the NPOs, organizations. Here it's much more difficult. Um, Number 11 is about uh, the proliferation of mass weapon of mass destructions, uh, WMDs as they, as, as they are referred to, um, and really using funds with the, with the relevant UNSCRs. We, each country has their sanctions regime, obviously, but uh, FATF is really the, the must do across the world. Uh, un unless your country has not signed on the UN Convention, which I think there are very, very few countries that have not, um, then you are supposed to apply the UNSC sanctions in your country, in addition to the national sanctions. Um, I'll, I'm going to go through the to the next slide. And I will do a little, of, a little bit of a, of a review of the results of the evaluation so far. So quite a few interesting, very interesting uh, outcome. Uh, I did compile that um, from the, the data, the data dump that is available on the, on the FATF website. So um, if we go to the next slide, you will have a very high level summary of the uh, results. 
So far, we've had 102 countries uh, assessed, some of them more than once because they had the first evaluation, say, in 2012 or 2013, and then there were uh, subsequent uh, follow-up uh, review of, of the same, of the outcomes of the first evaluation. So if we can go to the next slide, please, madame. Thank you. So you're going to see the, uh, so here HE, HA is highly effective, S is substantial, M is moderate, L is low. So you can see that there, we, there are quite a number of countries which are in the ME or LE area, yeah, space. Um, if you're looking at, if, you look, if, if, if we combine highly effective with substantially effective, we only have 23% of the ratings in aggregate, which is a bit shocking actually. So when you think, oh, right, okay, you know, um, we've, we, we will go through, through this, I, 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 will, I will show you a bit what, what, it, what it takes to go into the gray or black list. But, um, you know, essentially, um, it's far from being a green sea here. I mean, it's, like, it's more like an orange, ready, kind of muddy, muddy space. Um, and when you look at the, the proportion of, so the proportion of the, 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 the sort of not sufficient rating, ME plus LE, you can see that some, some IO, some, 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 uh, some immediate outcomes, are really, really getting to the, to the super red territory. Like, you know, IO4 is 97%. So we are far across the world from being effective. Very, very far from it. Uh, IO5 is 90%. Uh, IO7 is 90%. So really, there is still a long way to go. Um, I think as illustrated by the next one, I'd like to show something that would be also an eye opener, uh, and, 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 may, and, and maybe reflect on the fact that it's not because you are in a Nordic country or you are, uh, sorry to pick on you, in Germany, or you are in Australia that you necessarily have uh, the, the, the top of the league, right? Okay, so maybe they, are, they, they might be a bit, a bit better rated, but if you're looking at this table, by the way, these are associate members. So these are supposed to be countries. Typically, I don't know if you, if you, you probably have, I hope you have uh, a risk rating methodology for your, for your clients. In the risk rating methodology for clients, you, you should have a country, the, the, the country factor, yeah? So typically the country factor, you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna say that country has high risk and that country has low risk. And then, you know, when you, when you, when you have, when you include the other factors, products, uh, channels, delivery, and, and uh, legal form, uh, legal status, type of company, industry sector, etc. Uh, then all of that will give you a rating that takes you to say it's very high or high, medium, low, depending on the, uh, on, on the rating scales that you've, uh, you've, uh, you've, uh, you've defined. But actually, when, you know, most methodologies, no, Malavan, you can, you, can, you can go back to the previous slide, thank you. Most of the time, when you look at your country risk rating, uh, and I was, I was recently actually re-looking re again at the, um, the FSRA. So this is one of the regulators here in the, in the UAE, which is uh, in ADGM, Abu Dhabi, Global Markets Regulator. And then the other one, which is the DFSA, the Dubai Financial Services Authority uh, in the DIFC. And, and I was looking what, what they consider as high risk countries or low risk countries, actually low risk countries is, is very funny. Um, they don't tell you exactly what the methodology needs to be, but they say, yeah, associate members or, or countries which have no major deficiencies. But if I'm looking at these, you know, if I'm looking at these countries, which are associate members, which I'm sure, or, you know, I would pretty much bet you would qualify as low risk in your methodology from a country factor perspective. If you're looking at Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, you can see that the ratings are far from being, you know, efficient. They're far from, being, from having an efficient and effective 
uh, mo uh, money laundering and anti-terrorist finance, uh, financing framework. So what, what does it take then? I mean, which countries are going to end up as low risk? I'm not sure. Uh, so it's very interesting to see, and, and that might differ from, from regulator to the regulator, you know, what they would consider principles under which they would consider, they could consider um, countries to be low risk. But I think, you know, at the back of the 2012 new methodologies and the ratings that we're seeing here, I'm not sure which countries are going to qualify as low risk, if I'm honest. Uh, so yeah, food for thought. Um, I invite you to go back to your um, to your ratings, to your rating methodology and uh, or scoring methodology for country risk. Um, you might want to have another look against the FATF uh, latest assessments, which is available. Some countries have never been assessed against the 2012 methodology, so it might be difficult then to to rate them. Uh, there are other ways to. Um, to rate some countries, but you know, besides these uh, these ratings, um, and please feel free to give me a give me a shout if you if you want to know uh, how I came up with with some methodologies. Uh, feel free to to give me a shout. I'd be happy to uh, uh, to share the uh, what I, what I, what I've developed so far for for some companies. Um, the next slide gives you the the results and the outcomes. I'm not going to say the bad, the bad, the ugly, and the <laughs> and the good because the good are not so good as you as we've seen. Uh, there are not so many very good ones, but uh, the call for actions are those which are what we what we refer to or what is commonly referred to as blacklisted. So we are very familiar with Iran and North Korea. They're not cooperating. Uh, they have they don't even want to you know come up with an action plan to remediate their their weaknesses and their gaps. So there are calls for action. That means that you know, there are measures, that active measures that must be implemented uh, on those. And, and then you have the under increased monitoring, which are you know, what we call gray list countries. Uh, and you can see there are a number of those. Now, that doesn't mean that because you're on the gray list uh, one day, you're going to remain there forever. Typically, what happens is that these countries would be subject to a, an action plan uh, with close monitoring of the effective implementation of those actions and the countries upon um, completing all the actions, these will be reviewed by FATF and there will be a recommendation to remove them from the grey list. So under increased monitoring. Um, under increased monitoring countries are usually deemed as high risk. Uh, similarly to obviously a call for action, I mean call for actions, most uh, FIs would even classify them as prohibited. I'm going to pause there because I think that there, there are some, um, you know, there are some statements maybe I made or, or, or some results, factual, you know, factual and objective uh, uh, outcomes from uh, the analysis which is, uh, and the results which are uh, publicly available. I'm going to pause there because I would like to hear from, uh, you know, from, from, from you, from, from the attendees to the call today. Uh, and I would like to hear, you know, what are your thoughts? Do you have any, at this stage, uh, do you have anything that springs to mind and, uh, or comments to make that uh, would, be, uh, would be useful as well to hear from, from everybody? So the mic is yours. You might, you, you, you might just unmute. Free to unmute your mic and ask your questions. Please. Hi, can I ask a question? This is not Absolutely. Yeah, I just uh, uh, wanted to know, uh, are all the countries uh, in scope of FATF or do they have, uh, what's the criteria of selecting a country for evaluation? Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't know the exact process to select a country over another. Um, they do some rounds. So basically, they, at, some, at some stage, all countries will be evaluated. Uh, because they started in 2013, we, have, we had you know, uh, some delays this year due to the, the, you know, the pandemic situation. So a number of evaluations have been delayed. But I suspect by maybe end of... I would say 2023, 
or 20, later 2025, they should have completed all review, at least every country, I would think 2023. Uh, there are not many countries that have not been evaluated so far. Uh, but uh, there are some, some big countries that haven't. I mean, if you look at you know, Germany has not been, but they are uh, they plan to, to be very soon. Uh, France has not been either. So you have, you have uh, you know, major jurisdictions that are still pending uh, review. So the, the criteria for selection, I, I, I don't really know. I can find out but, uh, and, and get back to you, but I, I, don't, I don't really know. Sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, because that will really be helpful because uh, as we assess our clients as part of the financial institutions risk assessment uh, for cross-border trading, I mean, it's helpful to know how other countries are evaluated and where we can classify them, uh, our customers who are dealing on cross-border transactions. Right. You, you would anyway have, uh, if they haven't been evaluated before, they might have been evaluated before 2012. So you might want to go back to earlier ratings. However, just keep in mind, and we will go through the illustration of Qatar, um, there has been so much uh, evolution of FATF guidelines, international guidance, Volkberg, you know, all of these. The bar has raised so much over the last decade that you know an, an evaluation done in 2008 is now almost obsolete, right? I mean, obviously, what was required in 2008 is still very much valid today, but the bar has increased even even further. So I, I wouldn't, I would really take with a pinch of salt what any kind of evaluation which has been made with the previous methodology. Um, given how much evolution has, has been made on, uh, on, on, on guidance on, uh, and, and, and on FATF recommendations, even just to say that. So right. in, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the classification, I mean, you've got also some very useful uh, sources for information. I, I use, for instance, um, I don't know if you know, know your country. Uh, you have already basic information and you can also register uh, and enroll onto there. Obviously, it's subscription paid, but you've got very, very useful information on every single country and the, the, the reports are very detailed and they are up to date. And yeah. they will give you not only AML risk, but sanctions, whatever sanctions are being applied on the country, uh, Transparency International rating. So there are very, very good tools out there and, and um, information aggregators that Actually, and they actually come up with their own rating. Now, you can take their own rating or you don't take your own rate, their own rating. World Check is another one. Thomson Reuters, World, World Check, ex Thomson Reuters also provide uh, a rating per country. Um, it's very, very sophisticated the way they approach it. I mean, they take up to, I think they take up to, depending on what's available as data, but it takes them up to 330 criteria to come up with their aggregation. Uh, risk score, aggregated risk score, which I think is you know, enormous. Um, and somehow you, you need to keep the visibility of what's coming into your rating. And, and you need to agree with it. It's not like, yeah, let's take World Check or let's take Know Your Country. You need to really review that and say, okay, well, yeah, that, you know, that makes sense. If you want to override it, you need to have good reasons, but you, know, you, can, you can definitely take that as a basis. Um, but there are very good aggregators out there, all sorts of information beyond what just on fat. Yeah, we're using WorldCheck. Right? Yeah, you're using WorldCheck. So WorldCheck has got, you know, risk score. Um, I think if I remember, they have risk score under three different kind of theme, thematic. And um, it's very difficult to, to understand exactly what's coming into the score because it's, the methodology is very complex. Uh, I think know your, know your countries is a bit more, um, is a bit lighter in terms of number of data sources they take. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, w w World Check is a very good, is, is a very good source. Right. On the same notes, uh, Daniel Harry from Commercial Bank, I just had a quick question. Uh, on the same notes, we're actually using sort of a combination of uh, the FATF information as well as Basel AML Index. That's one of, one of the ones that uh, we have been utilizing. Having said that, there are um, there are areas that I wanted to ask. Actually, going back to the previous slide, you had mentioned Mexico, for example, as one of the low-risk countries. 
now based on the of you know the obvious uh, money laundering situation that's happening you know due mm-hmm. to the cartel involvements and whatnot uh, I just wanted to know how you justify um, having Mexico for example as a as a like potentially lower sort of risk country that's one and um, secondly um, like I mentioned on on, on Basel ML index uh, and based on that uh, categorization due to the fact that for example a country like Estonia hasn't hasn't um, you know, undergone the recent uh, FATF sort of uh, review, they are still uh, kind of rated quite low. Whereas, as as I'm sure you're aware, Estonia is is quite, you know, they're they're in quite a bit of uh, trouble recently over over uh, laxes in money laundering. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get your feedback on 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 those uh, two, for example. I'll be I'll I'll be uh, I'll be looking at those. Uh, I'll, I'll check those uh, with Know Your Country. Uh, score and I'll, I'll have a look, but yeah, Mexico is. Uh, I, I, I highlighted actually, Mexico is on the list of associate members, and I think it's because of that very categorization that, but well, you know, a number of others, Russia as well is as an associate members. You know, you got. Uh, it's like saying well, any members which uh, which is part of a regional fat organization is is low risk. Well, no, because you end up with the whole planet, right? Correct. So. Every, pretty much every country is part of a, of a FATF regional body. So I would say Mexico has always been and should have always been very high risk in terms of money laundering proceeds of drug trafficking, obviously. Um, it's not new. So the fact, I think the fact that Mexico was an associate member and because we've been, a lot of FIs have been doing shortcuts and say all, all associate members, because of regulators as well actually, saying associate members are, can, can be all considered as low risk, as country, low, low risk countries. Actually, no, it's not. So I think this is where you have to uh, apply judgment. If you actually apply a rating, a score, which is, which is being compiled by somebody, by an external independent organization, or which is like rule-based uh, set by the regulator, you still need to question that, I would say. Yeah. Obviously, if the regulators is high, you can't you can't say no, it's low. You'll have to keep it high, even if you believe it's not as high. But if the regulator says all of these are low, and you're like, mm, no, actually, I think it's medium or high, then you have you have absolutely the right to to raise the, the risk rating for that country and and substantiate the rationale for it. Absolutely. But I, I'll, I'll I'll have a look and uh, I'll send you the results for. Uh, or I send you the link for of Know Your Country, uh, the database, yeah. and see what they do, what they say there. We used to utilize actually Know Your Country on those, uh, but then we kind of shifted over to Basel, thinking that it seemed as though they they were more comprehensive in terms of the number of kind of categories they were utilizing for their calculation. Uh, initially, we were looking at uh, Know Your Country, but this was a few years ago. But maybe, maybe, maybe they have sort of improved their 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 uh, calculation matrix. Yeah, I'm, I found that the Basel AML index doesn't work for some of my clients because the, the coverage of countries is very is too low. I think right. they, cover they cover 130 countries when we're talking about 249 territories and countries. So what do I Actually, do they the do rest? 130. I think the 130 is the initial. If you do the, the, their uh, expert edition, you get like a lot more than that. But, but yeah, you, there are a lot of countries that they're still missing though. Exactly. And some of my clients are really looking at you know, geographical markets, very much, you know, some, you know, for instance, Africa. Uh, and there are quite a number of African countries which are missing in their database. So, right, right. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I have, so if, if you've used Know Your Country, have, a, have another look. Uh, they, I've, I'm finding them quite up to date. Uh, they're even better if you've subscribed. They, they have a much more comprehensive review of this country. Will do. Uh, okay. Any other Sorry, question? Dan, uh, Daniel asked the second question about Estonia. Just reminding you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's Estonia, again, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not new, new. It's like Mexico. Uh, it's, but Estonia has been growing as a country. You would have thought that um, maybe some you know, dodgy practices or transactions that were not so uh, compliant would no longer occur after they've joined the EU, but actually no. So 
but I imagine that the situation must have been maybe worse before they joined the EU. Well, the recent penalties that were imposed on them due to their, you know, the, the access that was, uh, was noticed there and, and, and the fact that, I mean, I assume, the, I mean, the only logical explanation for them not being rated sort of higher risk would be the fact that they haven't undergone a recent FATF uh, review, I assume. So, uh, like the fourth round. So that's the only, I mean, otherwise, uh, how it's, it's kind of inconceivable for them to be rated as the lowest European country at the moment. On, on Basel. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's just uh, my humble opinion on that. No, no, it's, it's I mean, it's, you, you, you know, when, when a country, and that's part of the process, process uh, that mutual evaluation starts with the country itself doing their own risk assessment. So, you know, I, I, would, I would be interested to see the, this report for Estonia, but, um, you know, between between the connections with Russia and the transactions with uh, you know with with the Russian uh, uh, mafia and 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 all sorts of uh, and I'm I'm not anti-Russian by by any means. And apologies if uh, if uh, that's the impression you got. <laughs> but um, you know the what I'm saying is that it's it's not new and it's not because it's low that you should consider it's low. This, this is why I'm saying we take with a pinch of salt what's what you see as being communicated and in, in the public domain, uh, because it, it could be very much outdated and with what's happened with Fairbank, with a number of Swedish bank, uh, Denmark, uh, Danske Bank, uh, and all of these banks, uh, and, and some banks have been actually shut in Estonia uh, as a result of these, uh, of these, uh, these scandals and these, uh, um, you know, illegal or, or non-compliant transactions. Um, right. You can question yourself. No, it's, it's definitely not, not low risk. Uh, so, again, um, I, but, I, but I think it's also the country might be, for instance, medium risk. Now, it depends. You've got a number of other factors to consider. So, one of my clients last week uh, called me and said, look, and Sophie, I've got, a, I've, I've got a, a, a bank. It's not a bank. It's like a money service business. I said, okay, fine. Oh, they've got, um, there are, there are, there are actually that, you know, the volume of transactions is about 15 million euros per week. I'm like, what? Per week? 15 million euros per week. Yeah. And the guy says, look, um, apparently they are getting cash. It's a lot cash, cash based. So already like the factor of your know, product factor could be, you know, should be through the roof cash. Okay. Cash, right. 15 million cash. Money service business, okay, high risk again, in, in my view. And then they say, well, it's actually collected. We collect the cash from a number of antiques shops in Sweden. I'm like, right, okay. How can they make 15 million U uh, euros per week in cash? I mean, the, you know, this just, this just smells oh, super high risk. Right. So re regardless of whether you're in Sweden and Sweden is a, is a low risk country, overall, the, the profile of the customer is very high risk yeah, because of all the other factors. So I think when you're looking at a customer, look, don't look only at the, at the aggregation or the methodology and up off it comes up with, you know, it comes out with a, a rating X. Look at you know, the combination of those, that, does it make sense? Does it make sense that in Sweden, some, and I'm not even talking about Stockholm antique shops, they're all over the countries in small villages. So does it really make sense that, you know, you would get 15 million of euros per week in cash? It just doesn't, it just, just doesn't compile. There's something wrong in the equation here, full stop. You know, whether all, all criteria are tick, 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 low, in, in aggregate, it doesn't work, right? So in aggregate, for me, it's high risk, even very high risk. I'm like, look, I'm not even sure you guys have got risk appetite for that, but you're gonna need to have very, very high due diligence. So it's, um, I think you need to keep questioning and looking at, does it make sense? You know, does, does this business with this customer in this geographical location make sense? And um, I think you, you, you probably be overriding as well as MLRO and chief compliance officer, you might be overwriting a number of ratings which comes out as low, low or, or medium onto high. 
or vice versa. You know? So uh, with proper rationale documented, obviously. Right. Thank you. Any other, any other question? I, I don't know if I answered your question on Estonia, but I, I tried to do a parallel with Sweden. A recent, uh, you know, from a recent uh, example, I had to had to work on. So right. that's fine. Thanks. Any other questions on yeah. the? Uh, and I have something to say here. I have something to say here. Now, yes, uh, sure. Uh, now, uh, since you said that uh, it is like a case-to-case -case basis where you need to analyze the client yeah. and the the the, 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 um, the country involved. Well, what, ha what happens is if an institution, for example, a bank, if they have a risk rating system, uh, that risk rating system goes by these, by the, by these lists. I'm talking of the, the, FATAP, the FATAP list, OFAC, etc. So then, yeah. I mean, the, the, how, how will they configure their system when uh, in such a scenario, how can, how can they configure the system? Because they are going would by these lists. Would you mean, uh, would you mean by the system? See, uh, for example, the, the, the institution I worked for had a risk rating system. That's when yeah, the yeah. clients onboarded, they were, they were yeah. doing a risk profiling. So that was, they, they had a software and they had a system which is to capture the KYC information and provide the risk profile of the client. Now there, yeah. in terms of, say, say, for example, country risk is one of the fields. So now country risk, they are, I mean, the institution is totally going by the risks, um, by the list provided by FATAF, as OFAC, etc. All these uh, international organizations, they are, they are following the list provided by them. No, so, that's, that's sanctions. That is sanctions. That, that's not the risk. Uh, the, it's, it's different. I mean, the, the, the risk level of associated with the country mm. is, is, is not, I mean, how do they, they must have a methodology that um, takes into consideration the level of sanctions, but sanctions are on specific trades, on specific, then, then you don't have like sanctioned countries, it doesn't exist. And you go onto the OFAC site, it says black and white that they do not apply broad sanctions on a specific country. So you've got sanctions programs which are targeted to specific individuals, entities, vessels, etc. Uh, ports um, to, you know, apply uh, economic pressure as political as as a political tool uh, against these countries. So, you, I mean, sanctions is something different. So here you've got money laundering risk, tr terrorist financing, and sanctions. So what you need to actually assess when you assess uh, based on the money laundering risk and, and terrorist financing is to assess the country as you know, is, it, is there a particular exposure to terrorist financing? Is there a particular exposure to any of the predicted crimes or, or, or the criminal activities associated with financial crimes? So let's say human trafficking, modern slavery, um, illegal, uh, illegal uh, wildlife trade, etc., etc. Yeah. So Thailand, for instance, is known as a platform for um, you know protected wildlife traffic. It's known. Uh, the you know, Bangkok airport is, you know, the, the, the main area where all this traffic uh, happens and, and they've been seizing a lot of goods there. Um, so you, you just, you know, you, your methodology, um, apparently you've got, a, you've got a system that spits out rating. As a compliance officer, you need to make sure that you review on a regular basis your, uh, you know, your system. Your, your methodology and you're happy with it and you you need to actually scrutinize and and probe the outcome of it if the outcome if you're not satisfied with the outcome then that means your methodology should probably be re revised or you should probably go back to the methodology and say what, what have i missed um and you need to you need and actually your methodology should be revised at least once a year once a year once a year is what you advise yeah I mean, I have, okay i have yeah. one more question for you um, yep. Coming to the uh, main topic of our uh, presentation, the fact of uh, assessment, risk assessment. Can you hear me, Anne? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Coming to the main topic of our uh, presentation, the fact of uh, risk assessment. What percentage do they classify? I'm talking of in terms of money laundering, sanctions, and terrorist financing. Like, how much a focus is on money laundering? How much a focus is on sanctions? 
Okay, so what, what they do, it's not, although you have recommendations which are particular to weapon of mass destruction, terrorist financing, sanctions, and money laundering, the, 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 the immediate outcomes are not so much in terms of effectiveness, well, except when you're looking at transaction screening, because that really speaks to sanctions. But there are no such things as money laundering is that, um, you know, sanctions is this and WMD is this. Um, give, I'll give you an example. When the FATF um, is requiring you to do, um, you know, rigorous uh, customer CDD, identification and verification, that is for, you know, that is valid for any, any, any of these. Money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, and, uh, and sanctions. Because if you don't have the right information and you don't verify that information, then you know, the screening might not operate properly or um, so whether it's adverse media or criminal list or again, sanctions list. So you know, a lot of these actually speaks to all of the financial crimes in the broader, in, and in the broader terminology, including sanctions. Okay, okay. Yeah. So do they, so now, do they... go, go for it. Yeah, what about fraud? Does fraud come under the money laundering uh, uh, session? Fraud, fraud is not money laundering, but um, so, so fraud is sometimes considered a financial crime. It depends on your, on your policies. Sometimes fraud is actually uh, classified under operational risk, sometimes under financial crime compliance. Uh, it depends. Uh, this is not focusing on fraud, but, but obviously, you know, you've got cyber, cyber security, so fraud. Yeah. Now, it could, be, it could be that the criminals use these funds, for instance, that you've got cyber criminals, um, you know, they, uh, they, they, they actually extortionate some money uh, to be, for you to be able to recover your, your data. With the money, they might actually fund terrorists. So it, it does, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the critical crimes that could fuel into money laundering and terrorist financing. So okay. it's like bribery and corruption. You know, these, these FATF do not speak very precisely about or specifically to bribery and corruption, but everybody knows, um, any compliance officer knows that bribery and corruption actually facilitate any kind of financial crime, fraud, external fraud, internal fraud, and any kind of financial crime you will see bribery and corruption very, very often, um, actually pretty much systematically. That's why it's a key pillar of a proper French crime compliance program. Um, yeah? Yeah, thank you. Not I have a question so here. I have yes. a question here. Uh, my yes, name is Tracy. <clears throat> Yes. So my question here is for the high risk country. Has you mentioned that you no know, Basel uh, will not cover all the countries. So if we do not have a software as such in uh, organization, is it better to uh, consider the OFAC and FATF list along with the Basel, or is there any other uh, reference or consideration for uh, to have the high risk countries data in our watch list? Yes, I mean, you could, so you've got the know your country, you've got Transparency International for uh, bribery and corruption because the higher the index, obviously, the high, the high index means low, low risk of bribery and corruption, perceived bribery and corruption. Uh, so yes, you have a number of other sources of information you can use. I would probably, I can definitely, Tracy, I can definitely uh, share with you uh, a few other a, a few other sources of information which are publicly available and that you can use to come up with your own methodology. It doesn't need to be doesn't need to be super sophisticated. I mean, I mean, World Check is super sophisticated. Actually, so sophisticated that if you ask people why is this country rated high, they can't even reply most of the time. They say, oh, it's yeah. World Check. Yeah. So very important to actually you you as compliance officer Amelaro, you are responsible. So you should understand and not just use a score that is produced by an external firm because it's your responsibility at the end of the day. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, sharing, I'll be sharing with you the, um, uh, if you send me because an email, you've got an email address, you can, I'll, I'll share with you the other sources. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Because hi, it's Annie, the number I, of the show. Yeah. Uh, hi, Annie, uh, I just have a question uh, regarding this uh, 11 effective uh, immediate outcomes. 
and the technical yes. compliance. So, yeah. uh, what is the level of the ratings that uh, is ideal for the country to achieve the satisfactory mutual evaluation? As you discussed that uh, tw only 23% of the countries that achieved this high level and the substantial level. So, uh, what what you propose the criteria is best for any country to achieve both the you know the compliance objectives. <laughs> Right, so let, let, me, let me go on to the next slide, uh, Malavan, if you want to go to the next slide and I'll, I'll show you what, uh, um, you know, what were the ratings, it, 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 might, it might answer some of your question. Now, if you're looking at the ratings, there, there are no such over rating that the FATF provides. Yeah, they provide an re analysis report and they provide the details of the 11 ratings under IO and 40 ratings under uh, te te uh, technical uh, technical assessment. Yeah. What what and so from reviewing the ratings uh, from countries which are under increased monitoring, and countries which have just passed the bar, which were were not listed as grey, um, and looking at the region in particular, uh, I think Malavan, if you want to um, show the next slide, the following slide, which is called a view from the GCC, you you that will give you a flavour. Uh, if, 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 I give, if I give you a flavor on the, on the results for a number of uh, countries which are under increased monitoring. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so when, when, when the, UAE, uh, the UAE was evaluated earlier this year, and uh, if you read the report for the UAE, uh, I'm not saying any of that, obviously. Uh, it's not very complimentary. I mean, the, the, the report is, um, is not very positive. There are, they have a, num a huge number of uh, gaps and weaknesses to address. However, they're not on the gray list. So you can see, um, I don't know if Malavan, you've, uh, can you see the, um, the, the presentation with the yeah, three yeah. Uh, countries? Okay, so if, you, if you're looking at, at all of these three, none of them had, had any ratings high effectiveness, rated high effectiveness, none of them. Yeah, zero, zero, zero. You can see that mainly they were in the moderate. Yeah, they, they probably yeah. moderate. So when you moderate, even if you're just moderate overall, it, fee, it looks like you're not gonna end up on the gray list. Those countries which are on the gray list where those countries were pretty much they have as they have been rated low on every one of the 11 outcomes. Every one of them is low, or just, or 10, yeah? But most of the countries which have been put on the gray list, I mean, it's like you, you're gonna have low, 10, and one moderate. Um, they wouldn't even be effective in anything. They wouldn't even have any one substantial or one high rating. And the major, vast majority of the ratings would be low. So okay. really to be on the gray list, you really, really have to have no effectiveness whatsoever on any of these 11 outcomes. Yeah. All right. And, and, but and, I mean, that's... What, uh, and what about the technical compliance? What, what recommendations would you uh, suggest that are a key focusing uh, for uh, the fact of, you know, all the 40, FETF, uh, 40 recommendations are important, but what are the key uh, focusing for any country to, uh, you know, to get so the this, maximum? So this is what uh, what I'm I'm going to be covering in the next uh, in the next few slides. Okay. So Malavan, we can we can uh, we can go through um, the first the, the next two slides. Uh, I think I'm going to I'm, I'm going to browse through them because we've largely talked about these already. Uh, you can see as well that out of those outcomes which are not effective, we've got where most countries would fail, you've got IO2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 10, 11. Okay. A lot of them, basically. Um, I'm going to pass on Qatar's mutual evaluation. Those in Qatar, those who are in Qatar, I mean, Qatar has done a massive amount of progress since 2008. Um, Malavan, you might want to jump to slide number 17. Uh, those, the, the material is available, so you can have a look at those slides in more details, but um, they've passed a number of laws. Um, 
a number of, you know, there were a number of offenses which were not criminalized, which were actually predicate crimes for money laundering. So that they, those have passed a number of laws to rectify that. Um, there were uh, insufficiencies in customer identification, in records keeping, in suspicious transaction reporting, in the effectiveness of enforcement agencies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they've they've actually en en enacted a number of laws. Um, many of them came into into play in 2020. Uh, so this, they, 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 2019 and 2020. So they, they're making a huge amount of progress. Obviously, in order for the the, the effect. To be um, to be visible and to be tangible in the you know in the in the financial industry and applied by financial industry uh, and banks, you need a bit of time to implement all of these laws. So I suspect that you know it's it's a bit too recent. Um, I mean, it's going to be a challenge for Qatar to not only tick the boxes on the technical compliance because all of these laws are again the framework to tick the box for for that. But on the immediate outcomes, um, let's hope that the FIs, the DNFVPs were ahead of the game compared to the laws that Qatar implemented recently, and that they were already following best practices as, um, as communicated and issued by FATF, Wolfsberg, and so on. So, you know, Qatar is catching up, but um, it's going to, I think it's going to be some time before it's fully embedded into the, into, into the country. Uh, so yeah, you've had a number of, of, of rules, new, new laws and now regulations as well um, that, have been, uh, that have been enhanced in, in Qatar. All right. So I think we can, uh, maybe we can, I, I, I pretty much would like to get to slide 20, uh, Malavan, if we can, because that would give us some... Um, some very, uh, very common areas where you guys can focus uh, or requiring really focus. They're not only applicable to Qatar, they're very, its illustration is Qatar, but it's very relevant for, for every, uh, every countries and NFIs generally speaking. So one of them is, the first one is a risk-based approach. I've, uh, you know, during my experience, a number of clients that I come across where the MLRO compliance officer reviews every single client. And whether it's high risk, low risk, medium risk, it's like, you know, if, you don't, if you don't have a risk rating methodology and you don't have activities which flows from the level of the rating, then what's the point? Um, I recall that um, three years ago, I was working for a bank in the region, not in UAE, but in, in, in the region. And they had, a methodology. Well, they didn't know really what was driving driving the scores, and they, with their methodologies, they managed to have a portfolio of clients which was ninety percent high risk. And like, you know, that's not discriminating the high risk from the medium and low risk. So they obviously the, the team was completely under and under the water um, because then the, every single case had to be reviewed and signed off by the MLRO if it was high risk. So you can imagine that uh, you definitely need to apply, define and apply a risk-based approach. And if, if, you, if, if, if your methodology doesn't, doesn't allow to discriminate, then the methodology is not right. Uh, so you need to go back to the methodology. We had this discussion earlier on the country, you know, the country factor. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's one of the good, you know, if the outcome doesn't give you what is expected, then this problem with the methodology or the way you've applied the methodology either way. <laughs> But something needs to be revised. Um, customer due diligence. I mean, customer due diligence is everybody, everybody will know. It's identification of the customer. It's verification of the customer. And it's a huge amount of focus on UBOs. UBOs are, you know, it's, it's where uh, most of the focus has been, uh, has been given in the last few years. Um, I will also raise your attention on UBOs and PEPs, PEPs as well. You know that PEPs definition in a number of countries it does now include also national PEPs, not uh, or, you know, domestic PEPs as they've been uh, referred to, not only foreign PEPs. So that's, that's been a, a new ET in the, a number of regions legislation and regulation that they now include also national PEPs. Uh, so that is also raising the bar in terms of PEPs. And the Wolfsberg has just issued as well a new guidance with respect to 
uh, source of funds and source of wealth. You know, how to, because source of wealth is very re relevant for PEPs. If you have a PEP, you should actually apply enhanced due diligence. Uh, and enhanced due diligence, that I mean the high risk, but you need to apply enhanced due diligence as per FATF. And if that's the case, you need to, in particular, you will need to uh, review and verify the source of wealth for the PEP. Right. So I, I really, I really, really, uh, uh, you know, encourage you to have a look at the latest Wolfberg uh, guidance on the subject because it gives you some ideas and some tips on to how to evidence um, and verify the source of wealth and source of funds. And, and, and what's the distinction between both? And I think that's, that would probably require a whole session in itself. That might be a future session, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a, a topic which is coming back uh, very regularly and which is a focus of uh, the FAT, the FATF as well. Um, I would say that anything to do with transaction screening and the recommendation 16 of the FATF, which is called the travel rule, is extremely important. Um, this is where many, many banks have failed and been fined in the past and still are now. We have, and it's also where you could have um, staff within your, your, your organization. Uh, I heard about Estonia earlier, uh, you know, Danske Bank, Deutsche Bank had some issues around that as well. Uh, you, may, you want to make sure that your staff do not tamper or modify intentionally or not intentionally, but definitely not intentionally, the message and the content of the message for SWIFT. Yeah, because that is going to be a killer for your organization. If, if, you, have, if you are tempering, removing uh, some elements of the transaction message, uh, then that's going to be bad news for you and the FI, and you're, gonna, you're definitely going to be fined, uh, especially if it's a repeat offense that you're uh, that, uh, that affects a number of transactions you know, regularly and, and on an ongoing basis. So be really remind the staff that um, and make sure you've got segregation of duties, obviously, and also make sure that you have regular, regular checks on the quality of the content of the message and that no fields are actually missing or there is no rubbish in some of the fields because you will not, ha you will not be able to do proper sanction screening if you do that. Um, I, had, I had the example recently on, at a client, they had been running their sanction screening um, program. It was all good, onkidori, and then we realized there was something, uh, something bizarre that, we, that, that somebody spotted in operations. And um, you know, we were trying to uh, you know, always look at the very, very nitty gritty that doesn't look right and really question, mm, how can this impact on my overall framework? And actually, we looked at the, 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 some of the MT, which was the MT900 series, uh, which was really re, re, regard, regarding reporting, nothing to do with the real core message. And when we looked at, uh, we had some problems of quality of the data in some of the message fields, which were really creating like completely odd values, like underscore, square, uh, you know, where it should have been like a proper, you know, proper words, you know, in Latin, with Latin oh. alphabet. Uh, and we discovered that the, the, you know, the quality of 23% of the messages was actually compromised. No one, no one had ever tested or verified that the sanction screening was, was being applied properly. So there was no sanction screening done on this field properly and no alerts generated because it was like, you know, one, two, three, uh, arrobas, underscore, it was all rubbish. No one tested it on a regular basis. It was probably not tested before it was implemented properly. So, you know, you really need to have a look at the quality of your transaction screening, but the underlying message that you, you basically, as, as an FI, you generate, um, and that goes through the whole process of transaction generation and processing. Very, very important. Um, I so have a you, question you know, here. Yes. Yeah, I have a question here. When I look at the uh, UAE's uh, FATF uh, mutual evaluation, uh, technical uh, side of it, they have almost met 
uh, all the criteria uh, except uh, six of them like fiu uh, beneficial owners high risk countries those are the sectors which uh, they are like moderate or they need improvement on but when it comes yeah. to immediate outcome when it is on the country side of it has you mentioned like know your country which is how we do it in bank know your bank uh, kyb so it's when you talk about the uh, know your countries is it something uh, your recommendation would be to have a questionnaire set up thing regulator should have the questionnaires to uh, monitor their uh, member companies or the clients or what kind of a recommendation you have see immediately if we have to come out of uh, this and uh, we have to meet the uh, fatic uh, mutual evaluation in terms of immediate outcomes so what would be your recommendations Uh, in know your country uh, when we follow the so so most most countries now if you look at the the results when when you have a chance and you look at the results on the FATF site uh mm -hmm. you're going to see you're going to see that it's mainly green you know there the, there're not many atrocious ratings when it comes to technical compliance because yes. it's been out there that, that was part of the pre 2012 methodology countries now fail on immediate outcomes rating yes that that's really where the focus is and uh, i can give you we can go through um i'd like to go through the next slides because uh it gives you some best practices or what you would be expected against to meet against each of the immediate outcomes where you can make a difference as an fi So I suggest we move to, and then if if you got additional questions, I will take these at the end. If that's okay, Tracy. Yes, sure, sure. Okay. So let's go. Let, let, let's have a look, uh, Malavan. There is a, a, on slide twenty-two. We've got um, immediate outcome number four. Um, Is this the one, Anne? Uh, Is this the check. slide? Okay, sorry. Uh, Where is it? Uh, I can't see the slide. I don't know why. The heading is what it takes to be effective IFO. Yes, that's the one. Yes. Oh, oh okay. So, okay. thank you very much. Yes. So you're presenting on the blind. I don't know. I don't know where it. Where Where is the? Uh, <laughs> where is the screen? With the. Uh... Yeah. Welcome to online learning, Anne. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, I trust you're presenting the right slide. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. No, no, IO4. IO4 is if you want to really succeed on IO4, these are the the items or elements that you need to look into. Your risk-based approach. We've already talked about that. Must has be defined and applied. I mean, if you have a nice piece of paper sitting there and you don't apply it, it's not going to work. FCC program documented. Does you know? Does FCC program rings the bell to everybody? what is it it's document that is is basically it's basically like a risk management framework but adapted to financial crime compliance yeah so you're going to say okay this is how we manage we identify manage assess and and mitigate the financial crime compliance risk so it's basically the risk management framework but really focusing and detailed on fcc um if you need any help on that i'm i'm, I'm happy to provide as well KYC CDD the standard I mean there are still some banks who do not have a proper KYC CDD standard I mean how do you expect people to guess when to do KYC CDD what information to uh, to collect what to do with the information um what type of information is needed depending on the type of the entity whether it's legal person natural person what type of legal person um And, and also, how often do you need to do KYC CDD? You know, at, on, at on, ongoing, but what triggers periodically? How often, depending on the level of risk? You know, so you need to have KYC CDD standard documented. And I know it, it sounds, for for some of you, it sounds. Of course, we need to have one, and we have one. But believe me, not all organizations have one. Um, obtain and verify accurate and up to date basic and beneficial ownership information. we've talked about that ubos it's really 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 key at the moment i mean it's, it's the focus on ubos is massive absolutely massive um you should not and and many regulators have written that clearly black and white in their regulation if you do not know who is behind the legal the legal entity 
you should not open relationship with the customer. You should not pro process the transaction with the customer. It's a must. Uh, that, that is absolutely a must. Um, transaction screening and monitoring, absolute must as well. Screening is for sanctions. Monitoring is for money laundering. Yeah, monitoring. Monitoring will lead you to suspicious activity identification and raising of SARS. Something else that is very, very, um, you know, I would say it's a very key risk uh, and, and, and areas of weakness in many, many countries. You know, you're looking at, uh, alors, alors it, it goes both ways, right? Because if I recall, I think it's Morgan Chase, which was actually, uh, which was actually fine because they were raising too many SARS. But pretty much all of their transactions, they were raising SARS just in case, you know. Um, well, they, they got fined by, for that. <laughs> the regulator said enough, enough. They, they were fine because they were not doing proper SR. Uh, but equally here in the region, we have a tendency, banks have a tendency not to find so many SARS. So be really clear um, on have procedures to identify suspicious transactions and what to do with them and make sure that you, you find them, you report them to the FIU on a, on, on a very uh, timely basis. Um, and monitor of business restrictions. I, 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 usually, I usually stress that as well with the risk appetite. I mean, this is the foundation of, of, of good risk management, uh, of adequate risk management overall. But you, you should have a risk appetite that doesn't only say we will not deal with sanctions parties. Okay, I hope not. <laughs> but you know, you need you need to go beyond that, and you need to say, well, some of these. Um, some of these entities, some entities which are dealing with uh, in, high, in, in certain industry uh, uh, sectors, we don't want to deal with. Like, for instance, uh, defense, defense industry. Some, some clients, they say we don't want to touch them. Um, still, many banks do not, majority of the banks do not accept to deal with cryptocurrency platforms. Uh, yeah, because it's very new and they don't, they don't really understand it and they, they have difficulties to really mitigate the risk associated with those, fair enough, um, and so on and so forth. So you need to establish your risk appetite. You need to propose the risk appetite that then gets to the board to get, uh, to get set by the board. Uh, and then you need to monitor the actual application of these business restrictions. If, um, if, if in a bank, if a bank says we do not want to do business, with Afghanistan, then you need to make sure you do not do business with Afghanistan. You know, it's not because whether it's sanctioned, it's, of course, if it's sanctioned hit, you don't do business with. But regardless of or not, some bank says we don't want to deal with Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, full stop. Um, because it's, it's meant to be too high risk. We don't have an appetite for. Uh, and, and, and so on. If we go to the next slide, we've got uh, a snapshot on IO9. I'm just conscious of time. Here, really where you can make a difference and ensure uh, success for, for your FI and contribute to the success of your country uh, is, is record retention. Uh, records retention with being very clear how many years, but not how many years just say in a line that many years, how many years from what point of time. So it's usually six or 10 years or whatever from the time when the last transaction was made or from the time of closure of the account of the client or from the time, you know, it's, you need to be really precise in terms of records retention because I've seen too many times very, you know, very fluffy wording, which, you know, you read that and actually when you want to apply that, you don't know really what to do, you know, six years from, from when. So you need to be really, really careful and really precise on how you word that. Um, also, when you say records retention, uh, set also what is the expectation. Usually, the regulator will tell you how many days, but set also a number of days um, that you would expect the information to be retrieved. So, let's say no more than five working days, no more than one working day, no more than X, you know, 24 hours. Um, so, be, be specific as well in, in, in your records retention as well, policy. Uh, you need also to have policies and procedures if you are being, if you, ha if you have a visit of a law enforcement agency, an investigation unit, uh, you definitely need that in place. You need to know, people need to know what they need to do. 
people need to know who they need to refer to. People need to know who has the contact uh, with, the, with the agencies. Usually the compliance officer or uh, the legal counsel would be involved in the first place. And how is the, what is the protocol for communication and sharing information? Yeah? And what is expected from people? Very important. Um, due measures on accounts and persons. Make sure that you've got freezing and confiscate or, or to help confiscation of assets. Um, you need to make sure you've got blocking procedures and freezing procedures of assets. Uh, if you are being told by the uh, enforcement agency that you need to freeze some assets, uh, blocking of a transaction. If it's if 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 you have a hit on the sanctioned party, you have to do it. Um, if it's if it's mandated by an enforcement agency or court order, you need to have freezing procedures in place that you can action straight away. You know, you can't have people running around and, and God knows what to do next. Uh, you have to be really clear procedures in place and, and people know what they need to do. Similarly, I've seen um, here actually a bank I was working for a number of years ago. I discovered that they had no unfreezing procedure. And actually we realized that the, the assets which had been frozen seven years before had all been unfrozen um, and no one knew about it. So there were absolutely no control over unfreezing of assets. Uh, and I can, I, can believe, I can tell you that didn't go well with the, with the regulator at all. So make sure you've got unfreezing uh, procedures as well. And those needs to be extremely strict. It has to be signed off by the MLRO as a minimum. Yeah. Um, the unfreezing, not only the, the, the procedure and the policy, but the freezing as well. Uh, policies and procedures, yeah, you know, the record retention, all of these needs to be in place. Um, Malavan, if we go to the IO10, I'm gonna say a few words on IO10. I think we've talked about risk assessment. When you do risk assessment, and, and I insist on that, uh, terrorist financing, as, as you know, there were some specific terrorist financing recommendation by FAF, and then they included all these recommendations into the 40 recommendations. Please keep in mind the risk of terrorist financing. And I'm gonna ask, you know, especially here in the, in the geography we, we're living here, um, you're talking about uh, places where we have a lot of terrorist activities. Uh, I'm not going to mention those, you probably know them even better than I do, but make sure when you assess the country risk that you do keep in mind and you do assess uh, and consider terrorist financing. Uh, and this region... Guys, I think we lost Anne for a few minutes. Bear with us. I'm wondering why she had to disappear when she was talking about terrorist financing. Foreshadowing. She should log in in a few minutes.
Hello? Oh, Can yes. Glad. Yeah, sorry about that. I got, uh, I got um, kicked out of my system. <laughs> <laughs> Operational risk in, the, in their beauty. Anyway, um, I'll start my video. Sorry about that. So, yes. Uh, I was a little outcome. worried then that you know moment yeah. you said terror financing that you, something happened to you <laughs> i was captured by terrorists no no worries <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah in risk assessment i was uh, I, I highlighting risk of terrorists we need to consider that very very uh, very strongly um, we've talked about ubo's uh, sanction screening don't forget uh, the senior management or the controllers um, and on transaction screening, we've talked about that earlier. Swift message needs to be complete with good quality. You don't want to tamper with it. Um, you need to make sure it's actually adequate quality. And if you receive a message that you just that is just going through the organization, like a, you know um, a money transfer business, you need to make sure that the coming message has got the right quality of information. Um, and then blocking and obviously managing the queue of you know, potential matches or, posi or potential hits uh, effectively, because if you've got like uh, alerts uh, piling, piling, piling up, uh, that's not going to be very effective in managing potential risks. Um, we can go through the, uh, the next one, immediate outcome number 11. Um, a, bit, a, bit of the, a bit of the same uh, requirements re really that we can, we can focus on for immediate outcome 11. Um, I'll, um, so yeah, very much the same. Uh, it's just that here we are, we are, we're looking at the immediate outcome number 11, really focuses on proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, UNSCR, obviously that's for sanctions. So again, uh, sanctions at account opening because you need to have effective sanction screening and transaction screening for, um, for, for, for the effective identification of uh, transactions that are um, moving money uh, to sanctioned parties. And um, so if we're looking at now the, I've got a key summary requirements for FIs that um, I don't, I'm not going to go through, but uh, because we've, we've just gone through them. Risk-based approach, effective applying application of KYC CDD, the UBOs, the PEPs, domestic and foreigns, name screening again, national and UNSC sanctions list, obviously, transaction screening, transaction monitoring and reporting of suspicious transactions, and investigations and law enforcement orders that you should facilitate uh, the work of. And then if, I, if we go to the last slide, I will just to facilitate the application of these, these, these are for me very fundamental um, you know, this, this is a the, the foundation of a proper framework for FCC. So first you define your FCC frameworks, you know, what, what are the policies, procedures that you need to, that you're going to have. I haven't touched on that subject very much today, but the obligations register, especially in countries where you have evolving regulation and law, you need to keep up with this. So you need to make sure you've got a proper obligation register this in place and you keep updating it and you keep refreshing and updating as well your underlying policies and standards all the way down to your procedures. Um, corporate governance, definitely, because you know, corporate governance is all about the culture, uh, making sure that the board is up to date as well. They understand. Remember, that one of the outcomes is the understanding of FCC. This is, this is a very important at board level as well so that they can uh, apply a proper oversight. Um, don't forget the three line of defense model with independent testing, obviously. Training and awareness, um, commensurate to the role, commensurate to the individual, commensurate to the type of risk. Um, compliance monitoring and reporting, that's a must. Uh, don't forget as well the capacity and capability of, this, of the CCO and MLRO and their teams, because that's something that the regulator is really interested in uh, um, you know, looking into as well. And if they see um, teams which are uh, really snowed under or not adequately staffed, uh, they will make a comment. And then we talked about independent truth testing, whether the third line of defense, but definitely the second line of defense as well. Um, 
And I think that I will wrap up with these. Um, these two slides really are for you to maybe take away and, um, and, and see whether that's applied to, to, your, uh, to your own uh, company, bank, uh, and see where you might have some, uh, where you might, you might want to look a little bit more detail into. I will pause there. I know that we are uh, running a bit, um, a bit late but um, happy to take on questions for people who can I, I, I can, I can stay on the call for another 10 minutes. If you want to stay and have some questions, happy to take those now, or as well, if you want to fly some questions to me, uh, please do so either through Malavan or uh, directly on my email address, probably better through Malavan because then uh, he also has sight of uh, what questions uh, are, are of interest to you. And Omar has a question. Omar, go ahead. Omar? I'm not seeing. Um... Yeah, I think he has a problem with the mic. Uh, anyone else, uh, would you like to ask a question? Hello? Yes. Uh, Omar, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, I am Omar. I work in Jordan, if I you. Uh, I want to share some of my experience uh, that I work for, for, from the mutual evaluation process uh, with my country, Jordan, uh, uh -huh. last year. And uh, I attended the discussion of the Moroccan uh, mutual evaluation. Uh, okay. The, uh, the financial institutions, uh, the MLROs here, uh, just to be so aware about the risk assessment. When you talk about risk assessment, uh, be clear that they will ask you about what is the most and important uh, offenses in your countries, at what the risk come. Be sure all the if I you or the financial institution uh, telling all the offenses, like not. Mm. Uh, and be committed and uh, in the same line with the uh, national risk assessment of the country. You can That's go, right. I think that the drugs uh, uh, cartel is the big serious problem in countries. And uh, another will say no, the corruption or, or you'll be in the same line. And be aware of the economic sanction and how you go as scanning your uh, customer, especially uh, EU sanction and uh, to be going through this process daily and uh, quarterly and when the when the updated and formed by the your uh, agencies your government agencies that the mm -hmm. eu list is updated you be do it timely uh, just that um, Omar, that's a, that's a very good point and, and actually as, as part of the mutual evaluation this is the first step that that is being completed is the, the risk assessment of the country. And, and I, I, I don't know to what extent, I mean, may, maybe you can, uh, you can share your experience there, to what extent are the FIs or the DNFBPs actually reading through these reports? Do they have access to that? And, and do, they, do they read that to make sure that they are really aware of the particular risks that are relevant to, to the jurisdiction? Uh, in Jordan, we share the national risk assessment with uh, all the government uh, parties and uh, mm -hmm. with the, uh, with financial institutions and the NFPPs to read it. Exactly. And uh, we make a workshop for them to understand what is the risk we face here in Jordan. Was the mm -hmm. most five uh, serious crime here? Uh, so the assessors will come with ask the financial institutions, with ask the MPPs, what is the serious uh, crime? How, how, what do you think the corruption is the most serious, not the other crimes? All the financial institution, financial institution should be have the same, not the same, but in the same line, the exact or five most serious crime uh, just. 
Yes, so I, I, I would encourage then all the compliance officers and MLROs to actually you know before, if, if when they get ready for a mutual evaluation exercise, that they reach out to the, uh, uh, to the regulator or the FIU and make sure that they get access to this, uh, to this assessment because it's, it's very key because um, you know, this is where you have a risk-based approach. A risk-based approach means you're going to put more resources to combat the highest risks. So if you don't know what the highest risks are, you're going to um, you know, uh, disseminate your resources onto the, on, on, onto the wrong areas. So that's really the, the, the very important starting point. So thank you very much, Omar, for, for sharing that. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad you're doing that in Jordan. Uh, I don't know to what extent it's being um, proactively done in all countries. But uh, you know, Qatar and Germany, you're going through the process uh, very soon. Um, I would highly encourage you to uh, have uh, get access to, to that report, to that assess, uh, risk assessment at country level, if not done so already. Any other questions before we wind up? Okay. Well, you, you always have the, the opportunity to raise questions separately after the call. Um, and please feel free to route them through Malavan and we'll, uh, we'll respond to them in, uh, as soon as we, we can. Thank you very much. Sorry, we had to cross 90 minutes. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, just a closing statement. Now, all the, uh, the, rec the entire session has been recorded. So we'll be sharing the recording with everyone. We'll also include a copy of the PowerPoint, which uh, Anne has used today, so you should be able to verify them. Last, for the ones who are requiring certificates for your uh, CPDs, uh, I've sent you a text message. I mentioned my email ID on the chat, or I think everyone should have my email ID by now. That's how you participated in the session. Uh, send me a mail with a name that needs to be appear and needs to be printed on your certificate, and we'll send the scanned copies to you. Thank you very much. Our next session will be on the camps preparation program, which will start in October. So if you require any of your staff to be certified, please let us know. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you, Thank you very much, Marvan. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, Anne. Most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nasir, Keep good friends. luck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>